All right, All right, folks, we're over here with uh, Rufus Stevens, the author of uh, Life Lessons from Miss Maddie. And I've had the pleasure of meeting Rufus at a couple of uh, places and know that he is a very powerful motivational speaker as well as one that has done a lot of great things in his life. But like many of us, he has learned lessons from his mom as well as from others in his life as well. But he went ahead and wrote this book life lessons from miss maddie so glad to have you right here on the radio show with mark lee so this is an ibm tv production and very glad to have you uh here with us so tell us a little bit about some of these uh life lessons that you learned and just tell the listeners a little bit about yourself mr stevens like i said i've had the pleasure of meeting you over at Haiti and a couple of other places around Durham. And by the way, I should ask, um, how are you doing? I know a lot of folks are still confined in their homes as we're trying to deal with the pandemic that we're in the middle of. So I guess I should start right there is how are you doing just in general? And then if you'll tell us a little bit about how you came about getting this book going. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, first of all, we're doing fine and we are, we're doing fine because we intended to do fine. We are staying safe. We're doing with the, clinicians tell us to do and researches. And so things are well at this house. Um, I am, I grew up in Savannah, Georgia, and I, and I grew up in a family of five children, a single parent, um, supported by a grandmother and a, and a surrogate aunt. And, uh, and my mother, I lovingly called my street fighter because she would do anything for her five kids. She was ends oriented. She taught school all over Georgia. Uh, for peanuts. Uh, at one point, we don't know how she did it. At one point, she had three kids in college at the same time. She 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 dealt with the, the, the racism and the hostilities uh, in little towns throughout Georgia, and that didn't dissuade her. And uh, we finally ended up in Savannah, all uh, finishing school and everything else. But uh, she was dedicated to us. And you know, sometimes, Mark, you live so close to uh, greatness that you don't see it as greatness until you come away from it. And then, such as it was with, with my mother, this woman was something else. Yeah, but she didn't wave a banner about it. She just did what she had to do. So it didn't seem like an extraordinary thing until we got grown and realized all that she must have gone through. And I, I might add that while she and my father broke up, she still loved my father. And she always told us, you love your dad, that's your dad. And reminded us that their breakup was between them and not us, and that we should continue to love uh, our father, which we did. Um, and so one day I, I just felt the urge and prompted by a couple of friends, and I make the point in the, in the book, that when they heard about Miss Maddie, they said, we want to know more. And so I said, I started to do a, a biography, but I think it would be much more meaningful and more consumable by people reading it. If I just pointed out some lessons, now this is not exhaustive, but these are eight lessons that we just grabbed um, that, that I know she, she and, and, and well, Trinity on our. And you said that she was a teacher, and I know a lot of times people don't necessarily have the kind of respect that we should have for teachers. So I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that, because like I said, you grew up with a mom who was a teacher, and this was in an era when, uh, in my mind, I think teachers maybe even had more respect than they have now. And a lot of times, uh, people want to see teachers get paid more and would like to see teachers actually be honored in the way that they should. And I'm a big supporter of that. I think that teachers deserve to get paid a lot more. I know that there is a uh, major TV uh, anchor, and I don't remember not anchor, but a major TV producer, I believe it was Shonda Rhimes, who said yeah. that uh, after she had gone around and had to do home teaching, because we know a lot of people are having to teach their kids at home, she thinks teachers should be getting paid billions of dollars, if not something along that realm, because just of what she's had to do, becoming a teacher while also still doing the production of her TV shows and things of that nature. So we are seeing more people definitely having respect for teachers. So as mm -hmm. one that grew up as the son of a teacher, what are some of your thoughts about the teaching profession and whether we're doing a good enough job of honoring our teachers? Well, yeah, and I, I think your point's well made. We are not doing a good enough job. These people are, they are ninjas. They, many of them have to buy supplies out of their own pockets because they don't get the money from the school district. My mother was a teacher in a time when, to your point, she was highly respected. Teachers 
all you had to do to, to earn discipline was to come home with a message that the teacher was not pleased with what you did that day. They were highly respected. And she was always called Miss Steve um, throughout Southern Georgia. And um, she loved what she did. I mean, she, and it went beyond books. She, she would often bring kids home that she would be mentoring. And my brothers and I loved it when she would bring girls home. But she was, uh, she, they were, they were, this was a time when, when you could hug a kid or you could, you know, give the kids some loving mentoring. And she did a lot of that. Um, I mean, she even taught sometime in South Florida, wherever she could go to earn a paycheck. And, and so what came out of that is that her three oldest children were all excellent educators. One just, um, um, retired as the, former chair of the music department at University of Connecticut. Another one is a congressman who just won his 13th term as state representative in Georgia. And my sister, who is an awesome administrator, just uh, retired about three years ago uh, down in Jackson, Florida, Jacksonville, Florida. I am one of the, and I have a twin brother. I and my twin brother are uh, the rebels of sort. Uh, teaching wasn't for me. Um, I, I heard another drum beat, though I respected it, and, and I went in a different direction. So did my brother James. But highly, highly respect teachers. That That is no joke. And, and highly valued and significantly underpaid. So you definitely can understand the importance of teachers in your own life. So that's a wonderful thing. And it sounds like you definitely have a great deal of respect and that a lot of folks in your family are still involved in the teaching profession. Mm -hmm. Now, coming back to the book and everything, I was just wondering, what are some of the life lessons that are most important to you? I um, was sharing some of the uh, things that you had in the back of the book, and there were some powerful quotes, including from some celebrities that uh, were talking about things that they were involved in and things that they had as kind of points that they made. And I know when I shared some of these eight quotes to live by, a lot of folks found these to be very deep quotes. I mean, one is one that you live by, which is age is a number that measures our place in time. It fails miserably at measuring our passions and our possibilities. But then you also had to quote from Quincy Jones that not one drop of my self-worth depends on your opinion of me. And I, I think a lot it. of times we get caught up in that. We're too worried oh about God. what other people are thinking about ourselves and worrying about how they are uh, going to frame their like or dislike of us. So just yeah. wondering what some of your uh, thoughts are on in that regards. Well, you know, I, I, I came to, uh, I dealt with self-image issues for, for a long time as an adult. And then I, I got to the point where I fell in love with me and, and I saw my self-worth and, and I, that's, that's when life changed for me, probably early mid forties. And, and I love Quincy Jones's quote. I, you know what, uh, I, I I know I'm great. I'm you know, uh, and and it doesn't really doesn't matter that you think so or don't think. And we, and I come I came to understand a lot of times people's opinions of you depends uh, a lot on their uh, damaged rearing or perspective on their own life. And um, so and you can't love if you've never been loved and that kind of thing. And so um, I hear them and I don't hear them. I just keep pushing. When I started speaking, there were people that kind of yawn. Oh, you're going to do that speaking thing. And uh, yeah, cause it, it's a passion. It's not just something I'll do because I don't have anything else to do. Absolutely love it. When I started writing, writing a book, it's, you know, you have your detractors, but you just, you just miss them because the, and become ends oriented because the ends um, justifies the means and, and we push back to tractors. They have no part of this, this, this chapter in my life. And I don't have to get mad about it. I just stay focused. Um, I am uh, with the issue of the quote about age is that I, you know, I'm, I have to remind myself how old I am because there I have the passion I say, and I believe it of somebody 20 years, my junior, because there's so many things I want to do and I want to run. In, in August of this year, I'll be 72, my twin brother and I. And uh, we have to remind ourselves of our age. Our kids tell us all the time, you don't look like you're 72. That's because we don't think like we are 72. And um, and so, um, yeah, it, age is just a number. You know, I love it when I hear stories. My wife's um, grandmother finally stopped doing income tax returns when she was 92. 
you know. Wow. I, I, I love people who, who disrespect the age number and go on and do what life calls them to do. So. Yeah, because you're right. I think that sometimes we get too caught up in the age numbers and the things that exist with age, and we don't think about how much we can accomplish even in the age that we're in. I'm about okay. to be uh, 58 on July 1st, so the okay. first day of next month I will turn 58 years old, and sometimes there are things that in my life that I wish I had done that I have not accomplished yet and may not accomplish it because of the nature of age and what happens in society. Like I said, I have got two nephews. I love my nephews dearly. I have no kids. So I saw you had your dad come, but I okay. am still consider myself to be somewhat of a father figure, an uncle figure, not just to my own kids, but to other kids around the neighborhood So and around I'd the community. Like so I think that sometimes, even if you don't have kids of your own, you sometimes wind up still having those responsibilities, even if they not may not be your own children. So like I said, I haven't had any children of my own, don't have a wife, but who knows, that could change uh, in the near <laughs> future or the not too distant future, depending on what happens on the, the social life and That's everything. Right. But, well, you know, God bless people for you because there were people like you who who impacted our lives. Because it was my father was gone when when my twin and I were three and the oldest was eight. And so, so, but that was, we were not fatherless. We were father functions. There were men who came as father's functionaries, baseball coaches, Cub Scout leaders, male teachers, male friends of the family, men of integrity that, that sold into us. And God bless people like you, Mark, because we depended on folks like you when daddy wasn't there. So. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm hoping I have that impact on others that I, do that with whether they're people in the artist community or in the activism community or some of the other communities that I belong to. So that is definitely what I try to do is have that kind of impact and give some kind of words of wisdom or share what knowledge I have either on platforms like this or in meeting them out and about in person. Because you're right, a lot of times folks don't have that in their life, unfortunately. And they have, like you were raised by a single mother and there are many people out there that are raised by single mothers. But one of the things you talk about, I know in your speeches as well as in the book and everything, and you alluded to it earlier, was this notion of not letting age stop you from doing things. And I know that you've done some amazing things, as has your twin and everything. Because <laughs> I think of that, I want to say that you told me that y'all have even done like some skydiving or some other things that I'm not going to deal with. But just because well, I'm not that bold. <laughs> <laughs> well, my twin has done some skydiving. I see no reason to leave a perfectly good airplane and, and, and jump out. But he has done that. And I think I, I often in my speech room tell people that he, at age 66, he and his daughter rode their bicycles from Dallas, Texas to Atlanta, Georgia, 844 miles in 10 days uh, at age 66. And, um, you know, it's... It's because age is not enough. If you want to do it, do it. I mean, you might have to do it slower than you used to do it, but, but if it's calling you to be done, you know, I would say to you, you're you're going to be what fifty seven, Mark? You said fifty eight. Fifty eight on July first. Fifty eight. I mean, the the irony of it is, is that shame on you, and I know you wouldn't, but shame on you if you talked about giving up now because you've never been this smart before, you've never been this wise before, you haven't never had. This, this many uh, life experiences before. So I can't think of a better time for you to move on life than right now. You are well equipped. And that's the way I feel. Uh, no. I know stuff I haven't known before. And so, I, you know, my, my, my quiver is full. So, Yeah, I agree with you on that. And I jokingly tell folks, and some people think that I'm partially joking, but, um, and it's only a partial joke because, you know, sometimes you don't know what's on the other side of the journey. And I know that you're a religious man mm -hmm. as well. And like I said, I definitely hope that the other side will be wonderful and full of plenty and everything of that nature. But, you know, I'm not in a rush to get there. And I jokingly tell <laughs> friends of mine that, you know, if I can find a way to do it healthy with a fully functional mind and all of that kind of stuff, then I'm going to go try and try to be like, one of the characters from the Bible and live to be 150 or 200. Like I said, I said it as a goal, it's an impossible goal, but hey, you might as well just go for it. And who knows, right. I could wake up one day and I'll be like 150, 180 and go like, hey, I made the goal. Man, I ain't mad at you. <laughs> exactly. So um, some of the, what are some of the most important life lessons that you felt that you learned from Miss Maddie, like I said, you definitely have it divided into the different chapters. I did read through some of the books, but I know you talk about 
education is non-negotiable. We talked about that. Absolutely. You talked about the fact, and I'm seeing you, you definitely got that lovely smile. I always thought that that smile of yours was just wonderful. And you talk about the fact of laughing regularly and standing firm. And then you also talk about the importance of faith. So those are just four of the things that I know that you touch on are things that Miss Maddie taught you. So you just yeah. explain to the listeners a little bit about that and how it came about and a little bit about those particular lessons learned. Well, you know, the, the um, um, out of the gate, you know, she uh, she went to college and, and had decided that she was a pre- preacher's kid and she went to college and decided that and had a um, great respect for education and decided that her five kids are going too. And I jokingly tell everybody, my mother gave us educational options. She said it was either education or medical attention. And, uh, and so we opted for education and all of us went to college. All five of us went to college and she got high interest loans and worked nights on the army base, cleaning offices or whatever she had to do to make sure that we, we got to college. And so education was key. Um, laughing. She, she didn't, she modeled laughing. She did. We didn't have regular sessions in the morning where she would wake up and said, okay, today you're going to laugh. But, she just laughed. She um, she didn't take life so seriously. I, you know, and and then I started to notice, probably in my early twenties, that all five of us kind of came to laughter rather easily, and 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 it became a nice tool of engagement with people, and it became very comfortable. And 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 really, I, I saw it in my own life and how it it, it was a wonderful uh, crucible to make connections with people. And so, uh, and in honor of that, it enables you not to take yourself so seriously, seriously and you laugh through some of the challenges that life brings to you. Um, she, um, uh, I obviously a preacher's kid and, you know, her, and a daddy's girl, her, my, my grandfather, uh, pastor at church and, and faith was a, a, a commodity in our household that was, all over the place, you know, uh, and I, and I thought about it. I said, my mother would have had to have, uh, enormous faith to do all the things she would do. And I, and I cited one thing, you know, like she would teach out in the country, the country might be 65 miles away from Savannah and she'd come home on the weekends, of course, Sunday nights. And sometimes she'd take us for the school year to live with her. We'd be going on some dark, lonely road, um, at nine or 10 at night. Uh, and I don't know if you know how dark it is in the country, but you can't see your hand before your before your face. And and she just she had the faith that she could make that. If, and that was during the time of the Klan and all sorts of uh, racial dangers and that kind of thing. But she 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 pushed through it. She had the faith that when she went to talk to a high interest loan manager to get something to pay for a semester for one of the her children that she would get it. And so that became a part of our lives. And as all of us have had challenges, as everybody does. And I think it's been our faith that, that's taken us through. So the lesson, the lessons stick. I think you had had four of them. Um, the, yeah, we uh, talked about the faith one and everything. Uh, the um, other ones that I had mentioned was education is non-negotiable, laughing regularly. And um, the, I think that's the ones that I talked about. But you also have, of course, self-image encouragement and uh seizing your speech which i did not get to that one but uh, of course the most important one which i think a lot of folks definitely try to live by on a regular basis is that whole notion of living your life intentionally and with purpose and with reason that's right on on purpose Uh, you know just don't just be here and 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 just let the 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 winds of life just kind of push you along have some kind of person purpose and decide what you want to do ask your heart what it what's it calling you to i see too many friends and and i i've given given my friends permission to choke me if they see me doing it they 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 get to a point they retire from a company and they spend the rest the, the other 20 years with great assets but they spend the next 20 years at mcdonald's or burger king talking about the 35 years they worked at the job they just retired from and and with all those assets, I see that as such a waste. And so I'll I'll never find myself there. Um, the other thing that my mother did, which which plays out well for me, is that she was a wordsmith, and she said, "Say it 
with season your speech and say it with flavor. Don't just say anything, you know. And uh, my, my mother always had a term for something, and 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 it became her uh, signature. And I know I don't know about the other ones, but I know it impacted me. And I, and people forever telling me, "Boy, you have a way of saying things." And, and it occurred to me one day that my oldest brother said, hey, "Listen, you you're channeling mother, you know, and uh, you're saying." Um, saying it the way she would have said it. And so I realized, hey, listen, that's her talking through me. So uh, we don't just say it casually. We try to put some flavor in it. So you try to like live that life intentionally. And you're right. I see a lot of people out in society that just seem to be going through the motions of living. They're not trying to be involved with their career. They're not trying to be involved with their relationship. They just seem to be going through the motions and not really trying to have, as you just put it, a purpose to their life. So it seems to me that that's one of the great shames in societies that we have so many people really? out there walking around without a purpose and without trying to have a direction of some sort. Yeah, and sometimes it's that the, the lack of chasing after purpose comes you know, from a whole lot of stuff. Just be fear of the possibilities. You know, I don't think I can do that, even though everybody looking at you say, listen, you are loaded with assets. I, I don't believe you, that you believe that you can't make it, but I can't make you believe in you. I can point to what I see as your assets, and and a lot of people walking around they have them, and they just don't they, they just don't actualize, and that's sad to me. Yeah, that is sad in a lot of ways. I see that one of our fellow IBM TV people, and that's one of the platforms that we actually air this program on, and everything IBM TV, and he was saying that uh, he he retired, and he's actually become busier than ever, and. Uh, yep. He says, uh, one of the questions he asks is, how do you find your purpose? So, like I said, he's a retired person, and I think he's still trying to find his purpose. I know he's involved in a lot of different things, and he's actually on the West Coast. So just uh, how do you find your purpose is one of the questions that he's asking. Well, you know, I I think it begins with you asking questions of yourself, you know. Um, what, What are those things that you seem to do easily? I mean, every time you do it, you just stick the landing in. And, and it almost seems effortless for you. And that's, I, for me, I think that's a passion clue. And the other thing is that, uh, you know, what are those things that people call you to, to ask you to do, and you always are excellent in it. The other thing is that when you think about something, something that quickens your heartbeat, just think about, well, what if that happened? And if your heart quickens a little bit or you feel kind of empowered, even you might pull yourself back from it, but I think that's a clue that, hey, listen, that's something you ought to consider. You know, you may say, hey, listen, I like to cook. I like to cook, but, uh, you know, I see these shows, chefs on Chopped, and man, these guys are great. I could never be that good, but I love to cook. When I think about cooking, my heart quickens. Well, well you need to perhaps uh, look in that more deeply because that may be your passion calling you to something b- bigger than, than you believe you can do. I... My situation for speaking, I had been speaking before and been a member of Toastmasters and something, and then I had a bit of an epiphany uh, that, that just kind of firm, confirmed I should be doing what I was doing. I was speaking at a, a 50th class reunion in Savannah, and it was a full room of people, 300 folks. And when I got done, there was a standing ovation. And it's like God told me, listen, I gave you abilities. I can't put it any closer to you than your throat. Now it is yours to move on. And so I moved on it. My wife and I went back to Illinois where we lived, put our house up for sale, which has been there. We had only been in it a year. We built it and we were on it a year. Put it up for sale, um, sold it in eight days. I resigned my job as assistant pastor to a church for which I'd just been named three or four months earlier. And we headed for Raleigh Durham. Didn't have didn't have family, friends, or jobs. I had retired. My born wife wasn't working. And I'm telling you, it was the best decision we ever made. That was three years ago, Mark. And I, I met people who just fed into me and, and my speaking career took off. And but but I mean to to your friend in California, it may um involve you uh stepping out where fear lives. You may have to go to an area where you're nervous about, unsure about, and you may have to just trust that you can do that. Um, everybody, anybody listening to this, you know, the first thing life 
ask you the question. So you're serious about this speaking thing. You're serious about this, whatever you think you want to do. We'll just see about that. And, and, and it'll come and see where you live and you'll have to stand. If you, if it's in your heart, just stand, get help if you got to, but, but don't relinquish that position. Cause that's, that's your heart calling you to your bigger purpose. You say that, and it's interesting you bring that up because I remember one time I uh, moved uh, many places. I mean, I moved many miles away, and I moved for two reasons. And when I tell you this story, you're going to be like, well, one of those reasons makes sense. The other one, maybe not as much. <laughs> but I moved basically for what I thought was going to be love and for um, a job. I was working at the time at a weekly newspaper in Raleigh. Speaking of Raleigh, I was actually working at the uh, – Carolina, um, the Carolinian. And I knew that I wanted to, at some point in my career, I knew that I wanted to work for a daily newspaper. It's been a dream of mine for years. I always wanted to at least experience the experience of working for a daily newspaper. So I applied for several. I went to a job interview in Shreveport. I did not like Shreveport. I didn't like the environment in Shreveport. It was very much of a uh, industrial kind of environment, very poor, not the environment that I wanted. And so they turned me down for the job. And that was one of them cases where you get that rejection letter and I was glad to get the rejection letter. Right. Like, I'm, they sent me the letter saying, we don't want you. And in the back of my mind, I was like, good, because I didn't want y'all either. So <laughs> I was good at that. But I did get a job in Boca Raton. Now, one of the things that I did not know about Boca Raton, it was a lovely daily newspaper, a small staff. There was uh, one or two other uh, minorities there on the staff um, that could be both a good benefit and a bad benefit. But like I said, I had a crush on a young lady from Miami. I did not realize that Boca Raton and Miami are not that close together. So like I said, when I'm moving <laughs> right. right now, okay, I'm going to go down there. I'm going to get a chance to be closer to this woman that I have an interest in. And I think I called her up and she's like, uh, Mark, you're still about, uh, you're, you're closer to North Carolina, but you still got a ways to go. You're not exactly <laughs> in my backyard. So like I said, that was something that kind of, threw me off at everything. So I agree that you do have to, and I, like you, I went there with no connections. I mean, I went for the interview, I got hired, but I didn't really have any friends down there at the time. I did make some while I was down there. Me and my mom went and looked at a space, so became friends with the realtor mm-hmm. down there. Um, Hogeland, I believe was his name or something like that. But um, And some other people that I made that were part of the newspaper staff and just around the community. But I did not stay there that long, partially because, like I said, I went down there without a parachute. I know what you're saying. That sometimes you got to take those risks, but I did not have that uh, backing system. So when, like I said, I probably had that job for less than six months. And I had some great news stories that I covered, and I got to accomplish at least one of those goals. I can't say that I worked for a daily newspaper, and I've worked for at least one or two other ones. I've worked for the News Observer as a columnist, and did that for a short time, not that long ago, like maybe in the last three or four years uh, that that uh, accomplishment happened. So mm-hmm. I can say that I worked at a daily newspaper. So that has been written off the checklist of the there bucket. You go. There you at go. At the same time, there are other things that I still want to do that I haven't accomplished yet. So I'm still working on those. But uh, So I'm stay glad that it worked out for you, but it doesn't always work out. <laughs> but stay on time. You know, and when it doesn't work, you go somewhere else. But, I, you know, one of the things that occurred to me, and I say it often, uh, there is no misery like an unanswered passion call. That because you're afraid or because you listen, this job pays good money or I, I, you know, a lot of people want this position that I'm in, but your, but you know, your, your heart is calling you to something else. You know, I was, I was an Uber driver in, uh, in Chicago before I left and I picked up a guy one day and, and we just got to talking. I told him what I spoke on and he said, Rufus, we were meant to ride today. He said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very successful uh, executive. I take care of my family. But I've been working on an adventure. Uh, and I just turned 50. I've been working on an invention. And I put it off. And he said, I was meant to talk to you today. You have set me back on track for my purpose, this thing that calls me. But I let the busyness of life get in the way. And I think you just got to you got to stay focused. And even like you say, Mark, even if you blow it, so you blew it. You just that's just one other way, you know, that doesn't work. And so you just you just stay on task. So. No, and I agree with you on that. And like you said, so, t- so often life things change in our life. Like I said, my dad, who is closer to your age, he's actually going to turn 80 later on this week. He'll turn 80 on uh, um, this weekend and everything. 
but he's actually probably on his fourth or fifth, if not more, career because he actually was a activist. Well, first he was in the military, then he was an activist in the '60s and the early '70s, and he, um, he and my mom started a radio station. He talked about rural North Carolina. Yes, I know about rural life because I grew up in Warrington, North Carolina. So um, he uh, worked there where they started a radio station with no experience at all in radio. They had no background in that particular really? field. They saw a desire for it. They they saw that there was a need for jazz in the market. There was nobody doing it. So they just kind of jumped at it and went for it, even though they didn't have the background in radio per se. So they did that. And his more recent career is he's a well-known artist. I mean, he does photography. He does some other styles of art as well, but he's definitely well known in the art community here in the area. And I would even argue throughout the region because he's definitely not just known here in the Durham area, but definitely throughout North Carolina and even on other parts of other states and other places around. So definitely all well known here in the area artist. But like I said, he's about to turn 80 and he still does his photography, he still does his uh, various other kinds of art forms that he is involved with. But I think that that's what I really appreciate those folks that definitely try to do the things that they are passionate about well right. into their what people call the retirement years and yeah. things of that nature. I think that that's one in my mind, and I just feel curious what you think. I think that that's one of the biggest mistakes that society makes is that it tries to push our folks that are pushing near retirement into being retired and and not pursuing things. And I'm not saying that yes, I get the workforce, and the workforce might want younger people in the workforce, even though. In some ways, I think that's even a mistake. I have a very dear friend who is a professor, and she's about to be, she's in the 60 age range, and mm-hmm. she's actually job hunting, and she's finding a very hard time finding jobs because she's in that age range where they want somebody younger, even though she's got a wealth of experience. Yeah, I, th- I think America, and maybe other countries too, but certainly America, in my opinion, has got it wrong that, that when you get 62, 63, 65, it's time to go sit down somewhere. Uh, for the reason I just said earlier, I, 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 you know, to me, that's the time to, 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 to ratchet up a bit. Maybe not do as much as you used to do because the energy is not there, but for, certainly the passion is there and you, you bring more assets to the, to, to the things you're doing. And certainly don't go sit down somewhere and leave the rest to, to rookies. I don't know any basketball team that's got five rookies on the floor. No, you can't win like that. You need seasoned folks, folks who know where the landmines are and that kind of thing. And and that's where we come in. Uh, and now you you don't want to have uh, <laughs> five old guys out on the floor either because they can't they can't handle that. You need the energy and the fresh insight, but but certainly don't write off the old people. Yeah, definitely. And um, Jim was definitely commenting away. By the way, he said it takes courage, some of the things that you're talking about and everything. And he's also talking about that ageism that just exists in society, that ageism is very much a big deal here in America, that we've got to get past that ageism. I mean, we talk about a lot of the other things that exist. And I'm just wondering, what are some of your thoughts? Um, I know we definitely want to touch on what the book is and about more and everything. But what are some of your thoughts about the Black Lives Matter movement that's going on right now? Because that's definitely taking place. And actually, I think we're seeing a lot of the young folks taking leadership in that. And sometimes I think that's a good thing. But I would also like to see some of our folks that are older take some of a greater role as well. I love I love what's happening. Um, I'm telling you, I, I grew up in an era uh, where you know, you you want to eat at a restaurant, you you went, you ordered your food and you picked it up at the back door. You didn't eat at that restaurant. Um, I got books and I talk about it in my book <clears throat> when I'm in first grade or whatever. And, and I got books that's already got Sarah Wis- Witkowski's name in there or John Anderson's name in there. These books were transferred from the white school and they were raggedy and, uh, and the, ki- the white kids were getting new books. And we got their cast offs. Now you can get mad about it. Or you can learn what's in these raggedy books, which we did. And um, so that's the era I came up in. And, and I didn't get to go to the opportunity. I didn't take it. The opportunity to go to white schools until I was in 10th grade. And uh, I think that was 1964. And um, I opted to, to go to black school. It was a half block away from my house. So, you know, and it made sense to me. But I remember going to grad school to the University of Florida, and the first time I saw a calculator was at, at grad school. And the kids who were in grad school, they've had them since high school. 
you know, and it, and it was just the inequities were all over the place, you know, the, 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 uh, and so when, when I look at what's happening, the whole world, 50 states, 25 countries, it says Black Lives Matter. They're simply saying what we've always known. But but our speech was too small, even as a body of people, we were not uh, we we're not heard. But people hear when money is involved, and 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 bigger issues involved. You hear when you don't want to when you don't want to hear. But but uh, uh, masses of people like this translate into income or dollars, and you listen and you do what you ought to do, if not because you want to, because it's money driven. So I, I'm glad to see. I love to see the young folks there. They they probably can't believe that we came up in a society like that. And their best friend who happens to be black, I couldn't imagine going to a place with him and they tell him I can come in, but he can't. They can't they can't fathom that. So they're all over the George Floyd story. And I'm excited about that. This for one time in my life about the whole race issue, I believe we're moving in a direction that's gonna have significant change. It'll be a while. I mean, it will be years before we get to to where, where we ought to be. I told my sister this morning, I think we may have to lose a generation before we have to, to start seeing some significant change in the hearts of people. Well, and I know a lot of people were thinking that same kind of thought, and I just wondered what your thoughts were when we elected the first minority president, because a lot of folks thought that that change was going to happen when Obama got elected, but instead we wound up getting the flip side of Obama by the current person in the White House and everything. Right. So, I yeah. just wondered what some of your thoughts were. When that happened those many years ago, did you think that we were on the verge of that change then, or did you have some hesitations about it even at that point? I had hesitations back when then because I, I, just, I didn't see anything else around that position changing. You know, if you know anything about the presidency, you, there are a lot of things you can do, but you can't change the hearts of people. Um, you and my biggest concern, quite frankly, for Obama for the eight years he was there was that that somebody might um, turn violent because they didn't like him sitting in the chair. And thank God that didn't happen. Uh, I I wasn't as hopeful then because I didn't see the buy in from the world like I see now. Uh, when you got somebody that's in, in Germany waving signs, thousands of people waving signs in Brazil or wherever, saying Black Lives Matter, that tells me, hey, listen, this, this movement is, is caught on. You know, our president has done very little to, to, to pull Americans together and, and even less to pull countries together. People who loved us now have stepped back away from us. And, uh, and I think I see, I'm, I'm very, very hopeful. I listened to an interview the other day with Samuel Jackson and uh, he was talking about, he said, it's a shame that I'm, he's 72. He said, shame that I'm doing the same thing right now I used to do when, when I walked with Dr. King and everything else. But he said, I'm as hopeful as I've ever been when I see the masses of people that have embraced the cause. So that's kind of where I am right now. Yeah, that sounds like a good way of uh, having that attitude and everything. By the way, Jim wanted to know the title of your book, so I'm going to put it up there one more time. Mm-hmm. It's Life Lessons of uh, Miss Maddie. So. Life what? lesson of Miss Maddie, and I assume that's a picture of Miss Maddie there on the yeah. cover, right? It is. Uh, you don't see the rest of the picture. She's playing with her grandson, helping him walk. Um, yeah, it's life lessons from Miss Maddie, and um, it's on Amazon. And um, I, I would ask you, if, if you, if anybody listening, if you go and buy the book, please be kind enough to leave me a little review. I'd like to know what you think about it, and uh, there's a place for you to do that. Uh, on Amazon. It's an easy ru- read. I intentionally wrote it to be consumable. It's like 67 pages. And I've had people say, listen, I, I got it for Mother's Day and I read it on Mother's Day. And I love that. Because how many books do we have in the house that we got? We knew we we're going to read it. We get the first two chapters and it never gets consumed. I want everything I ever write to be consumable. So, And uh, who are some of the people other than Miss Maddie? that really motivated you and really inspired you. You talk about Miss Maddie in the book, of course, but who are some of the other inspirations? We oftentimes have multiple inspirations in our life. I imagine you had other people that inspired you in addition to your mom. So who are some of those people? In in our house, one of the chapters in the book is called the 1016 Triad. 1016 West 46th Street is where we live. And my my mother would teach out in rural Georgia. My grandmother would take care of the house. That's where we lived and made sure that the the basics were addressed. My mother would provide income to make that happen. And then we had an aunt who was like a mother, a surrogate aunt. 
Gladys. And uh, she would be there for us just like a mom. Our grandmother, whose name was Janie, was always there. She was a miracle woman who would take 18 cents worth of rice and 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 uh, <laughs> and make a dinner, you know, a miracle meal for us. And, uh, and so there are a lot of people around us who who just, you know, um, inspired us and to, to, to be all we can be. And neighbors in the neighborhood who always had a good word for you and, and tell you I like something in you or that kind of thing. And they, a lot of that came from my grandfather, who, who was also named Rufus. And uh, he was a loving man. And, and I heard about him all of my life, literally all of my life. And I spoke at the Georgia uh, House of Representatives about five years ago. <laughs> and his name was still being mentioned, and he died in 1946. And so, it's it's his the spirit of who he was was a great inspiration to me, even though I never knew him. He died two years before I was born. Um, but yeah, there were people all around us that spoke into us, and we didn't have a lot. We had friends who had dads and had stuff that we we never saw, but we didn't want for love and inspiration. And so, I, if you ask me who else immediately, it would be my grandmother and my aunt. Wow. You know, it's always great having those kind of like people that are supporting you and things of that nature. And by the way, Jim was giving you two thumbs up and said he's already on it and he's ordering the book <laughs> as we're speaking. So he's actually to go, on, Jim. <laughs> on point and he's doing it as we're talking. So glad to know that he is on that and that he is doing that. Now, yeah. part of what your life is, is, like I said, you're definitely a motivational speaker, but you also, as you mentioned, are um, a person that has had a church and is definitely considered, in my mind, one of the religious leaders around our community. I mean, I'm a good friend with Carl Kenny and some others, but I was just wondering, how do you think that we're doing in terms of faith here in America? Because I know faith is very important, but sometimes I wonder if sometimes we don't get it wrong the way that we handle faith. Like I said, I think sometimes, this is my personal opinion, we get too caught up in the personalities and in the buildings and not in the message. And I remember I've talked about this on some other shows that I've been on. I remember watching a um, old, uh, it wasn't that long, maybe within the last several years, it was a new special on religion in general. And we're talking about the religious faith of the world, whether that's Buddhism, uh, Christianity, of course, Muslims, various other, various other faiths. And the basic gist of the message was that all of the message is basically the same, that it's really about love and support and a lot of that within all of the tenets of the various religions. And I think it was like a famous anchor. It might have been Ted Goppel or Peter mm-hmm. Jennings that did this piece. And I, I wish more people had actually, I don't know how many people saw it, but I wish more people had seen it and actually understood the message of what was going on. Well, you know, I, I, yeah, and, and, and a lot of the major religions have, have uh, the, the love theme, and uh, respect for mankind, the drum beat. Where we, where we Christians get in trouble is that we follow Christ and he says, I am the way. Well, other people's got, people have a problem with that, but uh, because you've got a problem with it, it can't dissuade me. But I think to your bigger question, what's happening in the faith community, I think we have, um, the numbers, you, you know, the research has shown that church attendance has, has, has fallen significantly. And people, for a whole host of reasons, we have not, often we have not carried our faith well. We've lived less at a lower level than our lips give service to. And and people don't believe in us because we invalidate ourselves by what we do. Um, it, we are at a different time. It's interesting if in the book of Acts, there's a, a situation where one of the uh, Jewish leaders makes the point that it's just a handful of men carrying this message of Christ and his words were they're turning the world upside down. And they were driven by passion. I say, I think on some level we've lost our passion. We 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 love uh, Hollywood style preachers who have you know twelve hundred dollar suits and newly whitened teeth and you know two hundred dollar ties and you know and that that becomes a, a symbol of faith and and you know and I have a real problem with that. Um, and so I, I, th- I think if, if, if people just embrace the simple message of Christ, which is which is wrapped in love, um, we'd be further down the road. Uh, I think people in the world want to see practical involvement on the parts of churches. You got a great big church up there. I know one church in Chicago that it's a Catholic church on, in a very rich community of Chicago. They were just building the, my boss was telling me, they were just building a brand new church. They didn't need it. The church they were in was beautiful. They were building a brand new church 
it would cost millions. <laughs> but once a year, they would collect canned goods for their sister church in downtown Chicago. You know, just missing the mark ent- entirely. And I think that's one of the problems we got. I th- you know, I think it's a whole host of them. I don't pastor a church, but I, I've ridden shotgun for three f- fantastic pastors, and I see stuff all around us. Um, shame on me, Mark, if I walk by your need in my hurry to get to Bible study. Yeah. Something, wrong with that, something wrong with that picture. And I think sometimes we don't spend enough time addressing the issues in our community. I'm thinking about like the fact that even within the church community and just the general population, we don't mm-hmm. spend enough time dealing with the homeless and dealing with some of the uh, very much ills in society. And then we also try to place, and I get it to some degree, but we also sometimes try to place judgment on people based on their lifestyle. And that's not what it's about. Like I said, you know, I think we should be supporting our brothers that are in the LGBT community and some of the other communities and not trying to pass judgment on them. And sometimes we get caught up in trying to pass judgment. Well, you do and on that community and other ones as well. I, you know, it's um, all of us, <laughs> all of us have done enough. If you believe in hell, all of us have done enough to go to hell. Nobody has any bragging rights. All of us live in, in uh, uh, glass houses. So I can't, I can't use personal pro- third person, uh, personal pro- down, pronouns as I talk about you, Mark, putting you down. I have nothing. Yeah, we're all sinners saved by grace. And it's been the grace of God that keeps us right now. And we understand that and embrace people. Use Christ as a model. He, yeah, he embraced everybody. There was nobody that he said, because of what you do in the world, I don't want you around me. In fact, he got in trouble for embracing people that nobody else wanted to embrace. So I believe if we use that as a, as a model, we get further down the the road of being legitimate in our faith because people look at us and cluck their tongues and said, I don't want any of that. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I agree with you. And by the way, uh, Jim was saying that he's already ordered it and he will review it for you. He said that uh, <laughs> me and you uh, both rock. So he said you and Ruben <laughs> rock. So he was, oh, I love it. he was enjoying the conversation and that he was definitely uh, going to get the book and continue to pass on that information of the wisdom that you learned from your mom and everything. So I definitely that that. That he's going to do that and uh, share that knowledge with others around. Um, how many places have you actually traveled to? Like I said, I know I was talking to a friend of mine who's actually in Germany and she's actually a yoga practitioner. And I had a chance to have a conversation with her on another show and she's moved from North Carolina to Germany with her husband and is because he's military. But uh, like I said, she's done some world traveling. I was telling her that I've not done enough world traveling. That's talking about the bucket list. That's on my bucket list. Is yep. I've uh, went on a yep. cruise, which is basically U.S. properties. It was Puerto Rico, right. U.S. Virgin Islands, and the Grand Turk. But other than that, I was in Turkey when I was like about six months old to maybe <laughs> three or something like that. And other than that, no world travels. So I know I want to do more world travels, but I was just curious about yourself. How much world travel have you done? Not a lot, not not enough. As a matter of fact, we had we had planned to go to Europe, uh, shoot about a year ago, and we had a friend passed away, and who was going to go, and that's kind of uh, broke our stride. And we will be going to Israel and in, uh, in April if we're allowed to to go. And uh, and, and there are a lot of places that that I want to go, and uh, but um, and and. I'll try to get to as many as I can, but I, I, I the other thing is that while I, I want to go to those places, there are a bunch of places in the United States that I absolutely want to go and see. And there's just, just the richness of our whole heritage here in, in America. Uh, I have not gone. Yeah, I mean, it's simple places that other people see all the time, and we just haven't made the move, but we will do that. Yeah, I'm mostly on that. There are places even in the United States that I haven't been to. I went to Vegas for the first time not that long ago, maybe about a year and a half ago, and that was mm-hmm. my first time going that far out west. I still want to get out to California. Oh, um, yeah. I do to Memphis, which is, of course, I'm a big blues fan, and that's a blues area. But ironically, I've never been to New Orleans, and I've heard great things about New Orleans. So Absolutely. I want to get to New Orleans. I want to get to parts of Texas because I've not been to any parts of Texas. Um, been to Chicago, um, even though I didn't really explore the way that I would like to. So I want to do more exploration of Chicago, even though I went to school. In Milwaukee, which is right across the lake. Right from the way, yeah. I yeah. need to have done more exploration while I was there, but I did not. And I'm a fan of Minnesota, particularly Minneapolis and the Prince Sound and things oh, of that yeah. nature. Oh, yeah. So we definitely want to get there. So there are a number of places like you that I would like to get to, even here in our own country, in addition to 
visiting some places around the world. If you had to say something that was on your bucket list of something that you've always it's on your bucket list of things you want to do. And by the way, I was a big fan of that movie. I remember my dad called me over. So to me, him, and uh, my younger brother, who's uh, turned 50 uh, last year, we all watched it. We all got to watch that movie shortly after it came out. And I remember that was a great movie and everything. But oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. it was very much of a uh, thing that we all go through, particularly as we get older. But what's on your bucket list that you haven't accomplished? You're talking about your brother. He, and I'm with you. I'm not trying to get out of a perfectly good <laughs> airplane. An airplane is to get me from point A to point B. <laughs> right. I fall out of. So I'm with you on that one. But are there other things that are that are on your bucket list that you would like to do? Absolutely. I, I think one of the ones that I've wanted to do for some time was to travel to Australia and New Zealand. And uh, the other one is a speaker. I want to speak before a crowd of 10,000 people. Um, that's That's high on my list. Uh, and I don't need to be the marquee pay people uh, person. I could be there with 25 other people as long as the 10,000 people are in the seats. And so th- those are big, those are big ones for me. Um, and there's, a, there's a bunch of places, things I wanted to do. I've never seen the redwoods and, um, and I want to spend some time out, out west and monument park and, uh, and, a, and a bunch of other places. Um, so those are, those are big for me. Yeah, those are some great ones. I can definitely see where that would be amazing and have an opportunity to do that. Uh, speaking of the speaking engagement, I remember one time, a, uh, and it was actually one of our past guests here, Ron Thomas, he lives in Dubai, and he was talking about the fact that he actually retired and moved to Dubai, and he wanted to do more motivational speaking. He had worked with Martha Stewart, worked for a number of other people, and what he did is he just actually reached out and reached out to several conferences and basically said, look, I've got all this experience. He's a, got a wealth of corporate knowledge. As like I said, Martha Stewart was just part of what he's done. He's worked for mm-hmm. major companies and everything like that. But he basically told them, he took the opposite approach of what a lot of people would do. He went out there, reached out to them and said, look, I know y'all have been planning these conferences. If a speaker happens to drop out, know that I'm available. And like I said, he's an older gentleman. I think he might be in his, uh, I want to say somewhere around 60s or 70s. And he said that I think he sent that letter out to several people on, say, a Friday. And by Monday or Tuesday of the following week, he already had several invitations because exactly what he thought would happen is what happened. These people dropped out for whatever reasons. They might have gotten ill. They might have got whatever happened. They dropped out and then he stepped in. And he had a number of speaking engagements by taking that approach. So that might be something you might consider is just reaching out to folks and seeing if they've got opportunities for you. So I think that that's a great lesson that I learned from that conversation with Ron Thomas, who has his own consulting company out there in Dubai. So that's a word of advice to think about it, everything. Um, For those that are thinking about, because I've even thought about doing it, doing the whole motivational speaking kind of thing, what are some of the words of advice that you give to people that might want to share their life lessons and become motivational speakers? Well, you know, I, I think years ago, I think it was 1991, and I found a letter. I don't know if you're familiar with a phenomenal speaker. His name was Zig Ziglar. And Zig did a lot of speaking to sales group, sales motivation. He's a phenomenal speaker. He's passed away now. But I wrote Zig, he lived in Texas. I wrote Zig and I said, Zig, I want to be a speaker. And he wrote me back, I have the letter here. And he said, first I will tell you to join a Toastmasters group. Uh, The first thing you gotta do is is hone your skills. And he says, then give away as many speeches as you can. Speak to uh, service groups. They're always looking for somebody to come and give them a 10 minute whatever, and for free. (laughs) <laughs> and maybe they'll buy your breakfast. But it's not wasted time because every time you speak, you get better. And he said, give away as many as you can. Um, I would I would tell somebody, because that's one of the things that moved me here, become a, a part of a mastermind group, people who speak, who are doing what you want to do uh, so that they can coach you. And and, and I, that, coming to North Carolina, specifically here, uh, has done just that for me. And I got gigs because I knew people and they knew that I had skills and, uh, and they could recommend me. Um, so join Toastmasters. Uh, I, that's the first start. And then when you, when you get as comfortable as you think you want to be, start, write a message of some so- sort, something that you feel passionate about. Uh, it, it might be a, a message on impatience. 
<laughs> it's a 12 minute message on impatience. Uh, you know, write it and then look for an opportunity to give it. And there's tons of free opportunity, opportunities around here. Uh, Rotary and Kiwanis and a bunch of groups always looking for speakers. And what do you say for those folks that are always concerned about the fact that they have these messages, they want to share the message, but they're afraid that they're not going to get the financial reward? Because I know that whether it's music or whether it's just like in general, that sometimes people feel that they have the knowledge, but they feel that people are wanting to take advantage of the knowledge that they have and not give them the reward back, I meaning some sort of financial um, incentive, because I know that that happens. Well, you know what? Uh, I, I heard a, I had a customer tell me years ago an answer that, that speaks right to what you, you said. She said, she asked me a favor, and before I answered, she said, let me say this to you, Rufus. No is an acceptable answer. So when people want to take your goodness uh, and not uh, give you some commensurate value, then no is a good answer. Um, the speaking career, when you come reason, become reasonably good, is, is a rather lucrative career. Uh, people get on get on the stage on the stage and speak for fifty minutes and 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 walk away for depending on who you are and what your background is and your your level of celebrity anywhere from I was at twenty five hundred to fifteen thousand dollars twenty thousand dollars depending on who you are and so it can be very lucrative. Um, I, I would tell anybody who is looking to get into business spend uh, your your the, the lion's share of your time getting good. Get good on the stage. And the Bible says your gifts will make room for you. So get get good on the stage. Don't worry about this and that and buying this from that person and 50 books from this group. Get good on the stage. Learn the, learn the techniques of great presentations. I was a big Les Brown fan. And he's taken courses from Les on, on public speaking. I absolutely love and still love Les. And so find you somebody that's in the business, who's significant figure in the business and watch them and learn from them. And most of them have some kind of training thing. And so uh, you, you can be assured this, if you're good enough, you'll get paid. Everybody I know who's good enough is getting paid. So if somebody wants to take your goodness for free, that's not allowed. That makes a lot of sense and some very good and solid advice. And I think more people need to do that because I think too often folks are willing to, I've got a good friend we talk about even in the entertainment field, getting consultant and people wanting to get the consultant. But then when you mention a fee to them, that's when they disappear on you because they don't want your help. And a lot of times you have to be able to say no, like you said, sometimes okay. that it's, a, it's two simple letters, but it can be some very powerful uh, letters in and O. Yeah. And that, that will add value to what it is you're doing. If you give away stuff too easy, people don't respect stuff they get for free, you know? You could take something that you any other way you'd give for free, but if I know if I give it to them for free, they will disrespect it and they won't follow through on it. But if they had to pay twenty bucks for it, all of a sudden there's a respect level that wasn't there before. So yeah. say no. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you just gotta say no. You mentioned Les Brown. Who are some of the other motivational speakers that really inspired you in terms of like as you developed as a motivational speaker? Who were some of the others in addition to Les Brown? Tony Robbins, a uh, big fan of Tony Robbins. And um, God, I was trying to think. Oh, um, Jim Rohn. Jim, I absolutely love Jim Rohn. Um, I mentioned Zig Ziglar. Um, and I think Les was on the time then he was probably one of the the, the few African-Americans that, that, that was making serious money in the business. Since then, there have been tons of people who who've shown up. Um, uh, I forgot his name, Jolly. Um, I forgot his first name, but he's a significant figure in the public speaking arena. And so these are people who I listen to and, um, and, and watch and, and you realize why they're so good and that's stuff you can adopt. You can, you can, I could never be less on my best days, but less can never be Rufus. And, and so you, you, you learn from it and you bring your essence to the speaking moment, who you are. So. Yeah, you've done a great job of that. Like I said, I've had the pleasure of seeing you speak a couple of times, and I love the quotes that you have in the book and everything. And some of them, I just want you, if you could just uh, think of some of them. Of course, there's quotes that you have on yourself, but I like the quote that you have from, uh, speaking of Jim Rohn, we don't get better by chance, we get better by change. And then you've also got the quote from, uh, and 
I've got to gotta teach you about you putting this particular lady in your book because she got a lot of flack for being a political candidate and <laughs> for trying to run for president. So uh, you also have from Marianne Williamson, there is no passion to be found in playing small and selling for life that is less than the one you are capable of living. And folks would definitely argue that she did not settle for playing small by trying to run for president and everything. But uh, some folks are also wondering if she might not have stepped too far beyond her boundaries of what folks were expecting from her. It, 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 it appears she may have. It's interesting, that quote that's, that comes from a bigger quote called Our Biggest Fear. And and the first time I saw that quote was on the wall in the movie Aquila and the Bee with uh, Lawrence Fishburne. And on the wall was that quote. And I said, oh, my God, that's a great quote. Quote. So I went and found out often, um, oh, come on. Uh, somebody else was given credit for it. Um, Nelson Mandela was given credit for it, but it isn't actually, it's her original quote. And, 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 and that, that, the point's well taken. We, su- we settle for playing small. I dim my light because Mark can't stand me being as bright as I am. What's wrong with that picture? Uh, my, my Mark needs to get some shades or something because I can't dim my light. I, I got to be who I am. And and maybe you ought to reassess yourself if for some, some reason my brightness offends you. And and that's the point she makes. You know, that there's no upside of playing a small. Go for it. Yeah, but that's some great advice that you're giving. And I think a lot of more people need to take that advice. Just go for it. I mean, even here on IBM TV, I know that the people that are behind this, uh, whether that's Anchor or whether that's Kim, they're actually trying to create like an internet network. So it's going to be mm-hmm. um, almost... That they, as they say, it, it's going to be, you know, not a um, competitive in Netflix, but something that's even a different kind of atmosphere. But it'll be, as I'd like to describe it, almost a cross between podcasting and some of our regular TV networks. And okay. they're doing that work and everything, and they're actually building a global network. Ankit is actually out of India. Uh, Kim is actually based here in this area, as is one of her other business partners. But they are trying to build a very successful network. And as they say, they're trying to serve a lot of the underserved. Mm-hmm. One of the people that they have on the show is a guy that uh, does a show around chess. So he actually talks about the fact that chess is an underserved market. So he has a program around chess. They've got another young lady. She's in her mid-20s and is a singer so um, and a uh, musician. So she does a show around her life, and she's actually spent time between South Africa, where she lives at now, and mm-hmm. between uh, Nashville. And of course, she's not going to Nashville as much because of what's going on with COVID. But she's hoping right. that as things open up, that she'll be able to have that. Uh, I can't even call it bicoastal, but multiple parts of the continent, multiple parts of the uh, world, kind of atmosphere and everything. And she comes with her uh, folks who are kind of her managers and everything, and uh, and her younger sister who is also and entertainers. So that's just some it. of the things that they do here. So they're, they're trying to serve a lot of underserved markets and they're very proud of the work that they've done. And I, I'm a big supporter of theirs, as is my friend Zach, who started a funk show with them. So he's actually doing oh, okay. around funk music. So yeah. he's a, he played at one of George Clinton's early birthday parties <laughs> and also um, had his own band. So he definitely can understand those great lessons that are learned. So they're trying to do some very positive stuff here on IPM.TV, and I'm definitely a big supporter of theirs and trying to continue to see what they're doing here in this great community. And like I said, they've got, they're actually doing, and I would like you to talk about this. They just did a special yesterday, and I think they're going to do one on Thursday on um, suicide because a major Bollywood actor just recently lost his life, um, took his own life and everything. And I know that a lot of times, Motivational speakers have to reach to people that are at a dark part in their life. So I just wondering, what message do you give to people? I know one of the things I said is that oftentimes we don't do a good enough job of listening to people. A lot of times they're giving us a cry out for help, and we don't even hear the cries out for help. Right. And it might be something as simple as picking up a phone, because sometimes they might be calling, asking us for that help. And because of our own busy life that we live, particularly in the Western world, we're always busy, even in this COVID age when a lot of people are locked up in their house in lockdown, we're also finding a lot of people that are still being very busy with their jobs and whatever work they're doing. So I just I think sometimes we don't sit down and pause enough to reflect with the people that we live around it or are part of our lives. So I just wanted some of your thoughts on that. Well, you know, we have, we have a, a habit, a very bad habit of 
um, doing a better job of talking than listening. We, uh, Zig Ziglar, same guy who used to have a phrase, he said, God give us two ears and one mouth. And some of us hadn't gotten the hint yet. Uh, just to, to, to listen. There's some people, and I envy them, they are great listeners. They, they, they listen to you like nothing else in the world matters but you. And, and to your point, Mark, I think that that's critical to the people out here because there's an ache in their heart and they, they, they put on the game face and you think everything's okay until you get the phone call um, that something's wrong. Uh, I remember something Les Brown used to say, and it, it's resonated with me. He said, he watched so many young kids committing suicide, and he said he, he used to tell them that that's a, um, a, a permanent answer to a, tem- a temporary, a, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Whatever is going on in life, uh, uh, this too shall pass. You, you, can, you can outlive that, but when you pick up a gun or whatever your method of taking your own life, you end the story right there. And uh, and so I people who need to hear that, who hadn't even thought about that or are thinking about that and, and, and just formulating an idea in their mind, need to understand whatever you're thinking about it, this problem you're going through, it, that's not the end of it. I, God, I wish I had time to tell you about all the problems I've lived through. But it's sad because um, I have a friend that was telling me about a friend of hers who uh, I actually have a relative who took his life. And she was telling the story and I watched her face and, and she was sad, but she was also angry because when you take a, when you take your life, that's a rather selfish way to go out because you crush the people who love you, you know, um, on a lot of levels, you, you take your life, you never talk to me, but you would take a bullet and, and, and kill yourself. You, you, I ask you how you're doing. You won't tell me or whatever. And so they, they process it as, as, as being very selfish. I still see the pain on her face now. Uh, and there's a reason why he took his life and that kind of thing. But um, I just feel sad and I, I try to be a better listener to your point and hopefully keep somebody from that point. Yeah, I think that's what we got to do is we got to listen and like you said, try to find ways to intervene in whatever that intervention is. And there are different ways that folks might that's intervene that's no matter what they're going through and everything and you talked about your own life and everything what are some of the most difficult things and then i'm going to wrap up things very shortly but what are some of the most difficult things that you faced in your own life and what are some of the lessons that miss maddie taught you that got you through those so like i said that's a two-part question but what are some of the most difficult things that you face and what are some of those lessons that you learned from miss maddie that helped you get through them well you know i probably one of the most difficult ones was was in uh in 1995, in June of 1995, my wife of 24 years and friend since 10th grade passed away from cancer, and um, I, it was a it was a time of disorientation for me. Uh, we, we, had, we had two daughters that were uh, at that time I think 14 and 18, and um, um, within 60 days, my mother passed away. And I tell everybody I was a mama's boy. And there was very, it was a tough time for me. It was a time of complete disorientation. Um, and one of the things that, that kept me was my wife loved to laugh. My mother loved to laugh. It was laughter, remembering laughing, laughing points in our lives that kind of kept me on some, on some level. And uh, and the dedication to our children uh, to keep my head up and and. Uh, uh, my wife was a pragmatist. She would have told me, okay, when you get done crying, go take care of my girls. And, uh, and then I heard her voice. And so, so that kept me, uh, the, 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 the idea from my mother that had, you can make it, uh, that was a constant drum beat, drum beat. You know, your, your situation is not you. It's just something in the way right now. And you, you're bigger than that situation. So those lessons just kind of, kept me as I as I move forward and I'm in a much better place now but I'm not naive life is not through with me yet mm-hmm. as if you live, if you take a breath right now with some kind of regularity life has your has your name on the list and so challenges are yet to come and, and I hope to be strong enough to push through mm-hmm. and you're right sometimes it's just amazing the small things that can impact us I was thinking about a friend of mine who um, had a friend of theirs that just recently passed away and they've been trying to figure out whether that friend was going to um, 
what the arrangements were being done by the family for that friend. And we were talking and they got into some deep tears because they were thinking that that friend of theirs would still be around. Now they had gone in separate directions in terms of the nature of the friendship, but still they were thinking that they would still be there on the right. earth with it. And then all of a sudden they turned around and that friend wasn't there and they haven't had a chance to really say goodbye in the way that they want to because they don't even know what the arrangements are and everything. Okay. So I think sometimes we're just shocked by things that happen in our lives. Yeah. I hear my, 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 com- my constant what proclamation, if you will, is that we are all better than the circumstances that confront us. And that's true. Now, that's just not something I put in a speech. That's absolutely true. Yeah, that's very true. We all have to sit there and reflect on these kind of things that you're definitely sharing with us. And they're very powerful things. And I think a lot of folks need to think about that. And of course, the book touches on a lot of that. Um, If you were to give somebody, and I definitely want you to give people how they can order the book once again, and how they can reach out to you if they're interested. But as we wrap up everything, what kind of life lessons or what kind of message would you like to share with the world? We know the world's going through all kinds of stuff, whether it's uh, the virus, which we alluded to when we first started the show, or Black Lives Matter, or a lot of the other things that are just happening in society. And of course, just the individual challenges that we all face on a day-to-day basis. But if you were to give a word of wisdom to share with our audience, what would that words of wisdom be? I would say, first of all, um, always explore your possibilities. Always be prepared to push the envelope on your possibilities. And then decide, once you've decided what your passion is, run after it and, and, and becomes ends oriented and running after it. And then with regards to living to get older, give very little regard to your chronological age. Um, you, you, you're better than your age number. And it, and it doesn't matter that you've got to 60 and not done the things you wanted to do. You're still breathing. And so I would say run after it. I'm telling you, I'll say it again. There's no misery like an unanswered passion call. So answer passions call on your life. Well, and what, how would folks order the book? And uh, Hopefully they'll put it in the back of their bookshelf. I see yeah. you've got your bookshelf. With you. Oh, yeah. Here it is. It's Life Lessons from Miss Maddie, and that is my mother. It's on Amazon and also on Kindle. So if you're a Kindle lover, you can get it on Kindle and on Amazon. And again, I, if, if you opt to do that, leave me a leave me a review. I want to know what you think about it. Well, I'm definitely sure people will be checking it out and watching it and letting you know what they think about it. Like I said, we did have Jim Eade, who's one of my fellow uh, announcers here, and he was checking out the show and making some comments. And we also had uh, Ronnie Perry, who is a uh, longtime friend and a former minister here in the area who okay. now lives in Florida. He's a uh, Florida based. So he's uh, actually uh, used to be connected with Christ Central Church, but now he's got his own church down okay. there in the Florida area. So he uh, was also listening. I know that I've seen other people that have popped in and listened to a little bit of our conversation as well. So definitely appreciate you being on here on the radio show with Mark Lee. Thank uh, you, Mark. And they definitely teased me about that. It's on IBM TV, but that's the name they came up with. And I think it's a cute little name and everything. So <laughs> keep it going that way. So uh, definitely appreciate you being my guest on this particular edition. And I think that you definitely gave them some great lessons to think about and that you were willing to share. So we definitely you, appreciate friend. that. And just real quick, as I think about things as I wrap up just, and let them get back to their other programming, in your bookshelf back then, I've been watching that bookshelf the whole time. Do you have an absolute favorite book? One of the books I like a lot is Steve Harvey's book called Jump. Yeah, and it's it's, it's an easy read, but it's very definitive in it. I also have books back there by uh, uh, Chuck Swindoll and um, uh, Les Brown and other people as well. But but the one that jumps out at me is Steve Harvey's book called Jump because it's a definitive book and I like it. Okay. And is there a particular, are those awards that I'm seeing in the back or are those pictures I'm seeing in the back? Well, there's a plaque. Yeah, those awards, because I spoke in the the local newspaper where I live in Illinois, picked it up. That's the one that's probably farthest away. The one with the orange plaque is I was the Founders Day speaker at Savannah State University, where I graduated from. And uh, that was a plaque that I gave gave an honor. My, uh, My brother, who's a congressman, had had been able to appropriate 
like thirty million dollars for the for the university over the years, and uh, so they were honoring him, and and I got a chance to speak that day. That was a good day. Sounds like it. And just one of the real quick uh, cleaning up some things that were crossing my mind as we wrap up and everything. But you said that you lost your wife several years ago. If I remember correctly, you're actually remarried now, so you're actually you're with the second wife yeah. now. So, yeah. so folks can realize that even if you had your life love, and it sounds like your first wife was your life love, that you are, sounds like you're one of those people that believes that you can have more than one um, universal love or more than one soulmate, I believe is the term that a lot of people well, use. Yeah, I believe, I believe that. Everybody doesn't believe that. But but I, I married very well the first time, and, and there was no reason. Uh, some men were meant to marry, and I think I was one of them. And there was no reason in the world why I couldn't find love of a strong Christian woman like my wife, Cynthia, is now. And so um, uh, God has blessed me. So we are in a very good place, and we have... Went from two children to four children and grown folks that are out of the house and buying their own baloney. So we're in a good place. And now you're out there making a lot of success. And we're hoping that you're going to get that dream that you want of speaking in front of that big audience. I'm going to see what we can do. Hopefully, maybe Kim and some of the other people that are connected with this platform can help make that happen. Or that's maybe right. somebody that's listening, like Jim or somebody else, might have that connection that we're looking for. So hopefully that will happen in the very near future. Once that's again, awesome. I do want to thank uh, Rufus for being my guest. And like I said, I can't wait till uh, we're actually going to get back to big buildings like the Carolina Theater and the Haight Heritage Center and some of the other big buildings around here in Durham and Raleigh and around the area so that we can actually see you speak in public. Because I think that while you're a dynamic speaker and I definitely enjoyed the conversation, uh, just seeing you speak in live and in person is a wonderful experience. I oh, know that you. I had the pleasure and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I can't wait till we get back into a whatever the new normal is and are able to actually see you speak. It might be that it's a smaller amount of people because of what we're going to have to do in terms of separation and everything. So it was a 400 seat theater like the Haiti is or a thousand plus seat theater that the Carolina theater is. It Mm -hmm. might, in the case of the Haiti, be a hundred or so, or in the case of the Carolina theater, be 250. But we might have to make some adjustments, but whatever those adjustments are, I hope that we make them so that people can hear you and do the speaking. And of course we might have to do some interesting things where the 250 people see you speak at the venue and others are watching it virtually. That's, so that's right. That's right. Combination like that. Well, and that's, that's what we're looking at now, a, a virtual presentation. So that's, that's likely where we're going to end up. Yeah. Yeah, I believe you're right. appreciate it, man. Thank you so much doing, seeing virtual presentations where you see fewer people in the audience and more people that are actually watching it from their computer or wherever else they are able to watch it from. I don't know about you, but I'm a big sports fan, and I'm not sure how I feel about going to a baseball game and watching <laughs> it that way or actually get to a football game. I know I used to go to the Panthers, uh, not that often, but I went to like maybe three or four games down there over several years, and you know, seeing it uh, on TV is not the same as in person, but right. I know we have to make some adjustments and rules, and that's just the way society's going to be while they right. tackle whatever is causing the pandemic, and we try to find that cure and that vaccination and the other things that have to happen. That's right. That's right. Looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to it as well. Thanks once again, Rufus. And once again, the book is Life Lessons from Miss Maddie. If you've been listening to us, both here on this platform, and of course, we'll be re-airing it on our Next Level uh, Network, which is where we air our normal podcast in, in terms of Blog Talk Radio at, as well as some other platforms. So wherever you're hearing this message at, we hope that you will pick up a copy of the book and go out there and get a copy of the book, because I know that uh, I'm hoping that Rufus calls me back and says, hey, Mark, I had a spike in my cells, and it was all because of you. <laughs> Looking <laughs> forward to it. Four or five people will call him and tell him that they ordered the book because of this conversation. I think it would have definitely been worth it. So once again, I want to thank you for joining me, Rufus, and we'll be seeing you in the very near future, and I'll have to get you back on this platform in the very near future as well. Who all knows right, that you will join us or some of the other folks, and then we can have even more of a conversation about what they're doing and how they can get you out there as well. So once again, thanks for being on the show, Rufus. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. No Take problem. Care. Yep. Good guest.